Boom! What's up, everyone? Welcome to Simulation. I'm your host, Alan Sakian. Super pumped to be talking about abstraction and creativity. We have Jeremy Nixon joining us on the show. Hello. Hello, hello. Thank you so much for coming on, brother. I'm super pumped. Oh, absolutely. We have so much to talk about. This episode is going to be epic. Jeremy's background, for those that don't know, he's a machine learning researcher at Google Brain, dedicated to understanding the principles underlying information and intelligence with a focus on abstraction, creativity, and alignment. And you can find the links in the bio below, ai.google, as well as the syscreativity.com website and the modeled systems website, as well as which is actually a Google Doc, which has a bunch of cool stuff in it, and the LinkedIn profile to Jeremy as well. Check out those links. Let's start things off with one of our favorite questions to ask our guest, Jeremy. What are your thoughts on the direction of our world? Well, thanks so much for having me. It's an absolute joy to be here. Um, as far as the direction of our world is concerned, um, when I was in school, I wanted to write down my worldview in as much detail as possible. Um, and realized that there were umpteen values that I thought were worth instantiating in the world. And so um, to the degree that I could take the direction that our world had been on, say, um, in creating technologies that enabled the uh, you know, advances in the Industrial Revolution and in uh, really like creating computers and computational machines and machine intelligence, uh, there's a sense that there's a potential to solve all problems um, using machine intelligence that was extremely potent. And so I certainly see um, the, the future of machine intelligence as the thing which um, basically will have a very long-term impact on like what the world will look like. And so um, I have uh, a sense that that direction is very important and aligned my life with that direction um, as a function of its importance. Um, there is, uh, you know, since there are umpteen other directions in the world that are, that are worth looking at, but um, that for me turned into the primary thing because really, um, foundationally, you care about what is like the highest leverage, you know, you make a small change, and there's this cascade where the world takes a dramatically different turn as a function of the actions you took. Um, you want to know what set of actions look like that and make sure that you take the actions that are correct in that case. Ill. The, like you just said, the machine intelligence moment with civilization is about to be just the, one of the most critical transitionary periods of our trajectory. And so for your f fascination at, at, and involvement in the time period is yeah. something that drives you. I want to know um, on the journey side of things, okay, born in Waco, Texas, moved outside of Detroit after that. And who were you as a kid that got you hooked into science? Well, um, the easy answer is that I grew up with books more than I grew up in a particular place. Um, my dad was this English professor, and so I was uh, reading day in and day out. Um, obsessed with umpteen characters, so I guess um, certainly like Hermione Granger was my first love. Um, there was a you know, body of science fiction books like Ender's Game, where these boy geniuses um, are tasked and are also like, well, genetically um, set up to uh, basically like, uh, fight for humanity against this, this bugger race. And I was really interested in this, this kind of archetype, this you know, child extremely intelligent, um, using their capacity to have you know, extraordinary impact. And so I think that that was somewhat formative. Um, definitely the games when I played uh, growing up. I was very, this very obsessive child. So um, I think when I was eight or nine years old, I could play Pokemon Silver by sound in that, mm -hmm. you know, if you know the map, if you've memorized it, you can hear where you are when, you are, uh, when you're moving around. And um, that, you know, like natural memorization, natural obsession um, carried on to umpteen loves of mine. Things like, you know, reading um, the encyclopedia, like, I don't know, when I was in fifth grade, my teacher, like, very lovingly let me just read all of class <laughs> and, uh, instead of participating. And, and so I got, um, yeah, just I threw a huge amount of things that were fascinating to me at the time that way. And then when you uh, realized that you could, like, okay, you're pursuing so many things that are fascinating you, but then how did you know that you wanted to go into this next step at Harvard and pursue applied math and CS? Yeah, so it was far from obvious. Uh, when I was at school, I was interested in optimal decision making and optimal behavior. Um, so the fascination was with this sort of econ archetype, the uh, thing that, that knows its goals and that has some representation of an action space and can objectively uh, basically derive the optimal course of action in order to accomplish whatever it is that it's set out to accomplish. And I was a bit horrified by myself. 
So um, it, there, there are these beautiful ideas in game theory. You know, you can watch the rational agent taking you know optimal, optimal actions, and there's strategic behavior. So I was always interested in strategy. Um, from when I was a kid, you know, like reading about you know the, the exploits of you know extraordinary um, like you know genius. Um, like warriors in battle, basically, um, lots of these generals would execute strategies that were fascinating to me. I was like playing Civilization. I was thinking, oh well, like in the design of the Civilization, like how do you optimize it for like max culture or for mm -hmm. for conquering or whatever. Um, and so in all of these games, you're trying to execute some strategic behavior, and you have these. Mm -hmm. um, uh, sort of patterns of action that are very powerful, but as a person, you're experiencing um, all of these emotions that feel, at least to sort of the naive mind, like they're in the way of like optimal action. Um, and so, basically, the heuristics and biases literature, like I got hit with it when I was in high school, and um, the sense that there's um, like confirmation bias, that there's this sort of attentional heuristic that there are, um, is hyperbolic discounting. You know, you, you discount the future much, much more than you should. Um, mm -hmm. All of these sort of horrified me because I wanted to be able to think correctly or think properly. Um, and it was clear that I was far from being able to like act as if I was an agent, you know, act as if I was you know, a great character in one of these books or as if I was going to sort of execute strategic behavior in a game that would um, you know, basically uh, you know, let me feel like I had done things properly. Um, and so going in, I was mostly interested in a mathematical approach to economics and in mechanism design, right? So like, um, yeah, basically, how do I personally behave optimally? How do I create optimal systems? So like, how do I, yeah. it's like inverse economics, right? Um, mm -hmm. Where in mechanism design, you try to create the incentive structure that gives you the outcomes that you're interested in in the system. And by sort of tweaking, you know, a heuristic, like say, um, using money in order to transact rather than bartering or um, basically like the you know, vengeance of crypto can be seen in part as like this mechanism design problem. Um, we've created a set of incentives that make it possible for us to, to transact in a different way. You have to abstract over value in the world. Um, those seemed incredibly powerful and you know, the evolutionary mechanisms that design societies and that design biological organisms, um, those mechanisms are generative and are powerful. So I was thinking in a lot of ways mostly about game theory and mechanism design and applied mathematics was an attempt to formalize different kinds of, of well, really economic algorithm um, that would be capable of creating the kind of world that I thought we should live in. Yeah, so both optimizing your own best self in the world as well as the world around you, optimizing right. that. The system. Yes, yeah, the yeah, you, yeah you, you can tell from the childhood through the Harvard years that this is like so you, like hardcore yeah. you. Yeah. <laughs> like, I love yeah, yeah. It. Okay, so it was applied math, CS, and economics. Uh, also, you ended up becoming a top 10 player in the country in College Ultimate, <laughs> which you only actually started when you were a freshman. Yeah, right? That's right, and so you became a you be, you got to like a level of mastery in this in just two years. Yeah, that's right. So, in part, the question for me was, um, is there a way for me to turn myself into the well? Really, it wasn't about becoming the greatest player. Um, into a player that changes the game in a dramatic way, where I was creatively experimenting with umpteen forms of, of throw, yeah. where I. Um, put myself into training regimen that I designed myself in an attempt to, to basically create a kind of play, a style of play that was extremely dynamic. Um, but it was also very grounding. So um, basically I, I put in extraordinary amounts of work day in and day out and watching myself become more quickly um, was this, well, very general sense that I was capable of turning myself into something that was worth being. And so, um, basically, this is a very obsessive mentality, right? It's like the same person who's like playing this video game so much that he, he memorizes it so that he knows the map in intimate detail <laughs> yeah. um, is playing Ultimate. It's like forming himself <laughs> into, you know, the sort of, uh, you know, optimal player as, yeah. as, as much as possible. You're practicing um, the algorithm. And those are contexts. Yeah, 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 exactly, yeah. exactly. Those are contexts for growth. Um, and it's like a very fast feedback loop. Yes. Um, where I had basically systematically read the like literature and performance and in uh, basically the mental toughness and mental game. And um, for example, like I, I would deeply visualize every single extraordinary play that I had had um, mm. for a five minute span before each practice and then would Great. come to practice um, in the state of mind of the person who had executed all of those glorious mm. plays. Mm -hmm. And 
the sense that there were like a number of techniques which I could experiment with, which would dramatically improve my performance, um, that was instilled and was grounded, right? So it was obvious to me that it worked well. Um, and I'm thinking like things like that um, have been useful like throughout the course of my life. And so. this is another example of you hyper optimizing your efficiencies. And you, we're going to talk about some of these things later, but one of the ones that you just mentioned was coming in with that mindset of visualizing your previous hyper successes mm -hmm. in the past and yeah. kind of you're preparing and priming yourself for a very successful uh, practice or competition. Mm -hmm. Okay, so then afterward, you, <laughs> after Harvard, you read machine learning textbooks <laughs> because yeah. you wanted to, I love, I love humans that just are like, I'm obsessed with something, so I'm just gonna do that thing and then I'm just gonna be able to implement machine learning algorithms at the companies that I go to because I'm, right. yeah, yeah. So teach us about that and then how you moved to the Bay Area, did Spark, got into <laughs> Google Brain, yeah. Yeah, so it was a follow-on from a like really strong shift. So I hadn't really done any CS in college. Um, when I was finishing my junior year, um, I had this the sense that the thing that was most worth doing um, was basically asking like, what is the future of machine intelligence going to look like? Um, and what is the most important thing to, to make sure happens in that context? And so in order to basically understand it well, um, I knew that I would need to get grounding in computer science. So I basically took my senior year and I threw myself through the entire computer science curriculum as well as I could at Harvard. And uh, it was an extremely difficult and a like, dense and compressed version of that curriculum. Um, but I came out of it with a sense that um, if I like read this set of texts, I could get um, basically a position that would give me projects from which I could get access to these sort of elite machine learning research works. And the play was, I don't know, it's basically it was summer at Harvard. Um, and I put myself through um, basically like the basics of Python programming, like learn Python the hard way, uh, followed by Python for data analysis, you know, like looking at these linear algebra libraries like NumPy and like data representation libraries like Pandas, um, into like intro to statistical learning with applications in R, um, basically an intro to basic machine learning algorithms, not at the level of detail that would let you implement them, but that would tell you what they were, mm -hmm. um, and that gave you examples and like sort of exercises that you could do. Um, and then finally into the elements of statistical learning, um, which is this more grounded text where you'll get a presentation of an algorithm that's at a level that you could like implement the details of the algorithm if you say had a linear algebra library. And um, from those textbooks, I wrote my own machine learning library with sort of scratch implementations of, of every major algorithm in the space, from like, random forest to radiant boosters, like everything that I um, would basically need to know if I had been like doing a you know graduate program in machine learning or something like that. And in writing the library, you're right next to the algorithm. And the code is so close to thought where you can start doing research with it because you're sitting there with this, this implementation, right? And so if you decide you know, to, to take your clustering algorithm and update in a slightly different way, you can just write that down and it'll work. Um, and that was fun and that was fascinating. And I, and I, I loved that. Um, but it gave me this foundation. And so I you know, moved to the Bay um, at the time without a position. Um, and wrote down ways in which I could converse with people that would basically get me uh, refer references to the organizations that I thought I should be a part of. Um, so like basically contrarian truths about every major machine learning algorithm. So that like nice. whatever you know algorithm came up, I could tell you some fascinating thing about the, you know good. the way a random forest yeah. is incapable of generalizing outside of domain, or um, you know the way of some like linear model is more capable of generalization than anything that's tree based. So basically like I'm um, writing down these interesting facts um, in the face of a conversation about them, being able to be fascinating and um, leveraging that into referrals to to organizations that. Mm -hmm. um, basically would let me build out these sort of like large scale machine learning algorithms I was interested in. And the applications for these, like you said at the very beginning, this transitionary period we're in with machine intelligence, the next slide that we have, Ronnie, we have a application slide here and it's just endless, the applications. And currently this is convolutional neural networks. That's right. And what's RNN? It's recurrent neural networks. Re recurrent yeah, neural that's networks. Yeah, right. there's a sequence. It's, could be across time, and it's like uh, okay. this, this sort of reframe where uh, you have a long input as opposed to a single input, and it takes it in and recurrently processes it. Um, so, like the first letter, for example, in a sentence, followed by the second letter, followed by the third letter, um, and it will 
basically go through each input and do the same transformation over it. Um, but lets you look at a sequence as your input instead of a, a okay. sort of static value. Sort of a yeah, static yeah. value. Okay, yeah, exactly. so a convolutional neural network would be for an image, exactly. a static, but yeah. a, a, a recurrent neural network would be for, for a sequence. A set, like a sentence and letter yeah, exactly. by letter. That's so right. like NLP the is like NL speech. NLP, yeah. okay. So, so like an audio stream okay. and speech recognition. In question answering, you have a sort of query of what the question is, which is usually a sequence. In machine translation, you have a sentence or a phrase, whatever it is that you're translating. Um, all of these are usually treated as sequential inputs. And so okay. like at that time, you know, LSTMs and RNNs were the state of the art in those tasks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but these are um, applications. Let me see if I can also oh, yeah, hit this ahead. quick. It's just that oh, yeah. with um, uh, generality. So re recurrent. Recurrent neural, recurrent, exactly, recurrent exactly. neural networks. Within that, it's almost as though after every single letter of input, there's like a recalibration that's occurring with the right. best possible output. Yeah, exactly. After each input's the best possible that's output. Right. That's right. And then with a convolutional neural network, it just takes in the, the entirety of the image and then it starts, and we have it in the next um, slide as well, it's just that it starts then building out the, the things like pixels, edges, shapes, parts, objects. Yeah, and well really the beautiful thing is that all of this is derived from the data. And so, like this notion of parts, like we have a concept for this sort of object being decomposed, like, you know, your face has a nose and some eyes and a mouth. Like we have, we have words for those things. But the algorithm that's attempting to do facial recognition will learn from scratch in a lot of ways um, the sets of features that are predictive of the output. And so, there are umpteen concepts in here that we don't have words for where it's discovered some interesting and predictive concept inside of whatever data it's attempting to classify. And that generality is extremely powerful, where I won't necessarily understand you know, the, the sort of details of an image that like, predict whether it's, it's a dog or it's, it's Alan or it's Jeremy or whatever. Um, but it will discover from the data those features. And, um, and that paradigm is extremely powerful. Like one reason there are so many applications is that you just give it an input and an output, and it will find the representation of the input that is optimal, and you know, like, well, it's being optimized for predicting the output. And that is a powerful you know, reframe and paradigm shift in how to do something like classification. And, and this was, um, you, were, you were extending APIs for data scientists to use machine learning resources at Spark? Yeah, exactly. Okay. So um, I basically, was w interested in creating machine learning libraries. Um, and one of the few, at least at the time, machine learning libraries um, that still needed lots of development was Spark's MLlib library. So Spark is this like, large scale um, and open source like big data compute framework. So it's for doing lightning fast compute. And most people will use Hadoop to distribute their data uh, outside of Google, right? Uh, and they use Spark to do compute on top of that distributed data store. and its machine learning library, MLlib, um, had a sort of paucity of machine learning algorithms. And so the, the opportunity that I wanted was basically to implement these algorithms you know, from scratch and at scale and gain a very intimate understanding of how they work. Yes, okay, and then enable so many other people to use the ML so use, resources. That's exactly yeah. right. So yeah. I guess um, now you can do sort of like large scale image analysis um, on huge amounts of data you know, with sort of this native Spark implementation of convolutional neural networks. That's yeah, right, that's right. Yeah, yeah. Okay, and this is kind of like the democratization of the machine intelligence, which yeah, is it's open a source. huge, yeah. Exactly, exactly. Open and a lot of this is pre-TensorFlow, so. And this is like, pre-TensorFlow too. Yeah, yeah. So TensorFlow is the most popular machine learning language right now. Yeah, that's right, the li library. Yeah, yeah. Library. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then is that quite like modular, like component-based, or is it, how, how, how is TensorFlow for use? Yeah, so, um, they, it's both modular and has many different APIs depending on the level of granularity and the level of control that you want of your machine learning process. So, Can it um, be as simple as like, me saying that I want to classify images and me adding a component of, of a block of TensorFlow code that enables that to occur? Yeah, yeah, exactly. So okay, if you want to classify okay. images, there's a very, there are very high level APIs. So like Keras, oh, is, Keras is a good example of a very high level API okay. where you'll just say, you know, here are the layer types that I want. Um, you don't specify any mathematical operations. But TensorFlow allows you to go, you know, all the way down to raw, where if you want to say, 
um, specifying like exactly every matrix that exists and exactly what operation to perform. Um, it can also do that. And um, okay. there are different ways to interact with it um, at these different levels of analysis where at a high level you'll have say like this, you know, like convolutional layer, um, but within it will be umpteen different operations that you could specify yourself if you want to. Um, but in basically abstracting all of them into a single line, um, you have a much simpler experience if you're like you know, a user trying to uh, figure out how to set up your classification algorithm. Yeah, and yeah. part of the ethos of Google Brain is that all of you get to set your own research agendas and you disseminate your research uh, in a way that is uh, help for a healthy exchange of ideas globally. Yeah, yeah, and exactly. I think that's a major part, a major key for our future. Um, so the last year and a half at Google Brain, um, you've been spending a lot of time on abstraction, creativity. Um, I'm really excited to talk to you about these things. Uh, let's start things off with the abstraction of what is a worldview, <laughs> both generating a worldview and intentionally building a yeah. worldview. Yeah. I think that's worthwhile. So um, naturally, worldview is a very high-level concept. And people will have different instantiations of that high-level concept. So, so one instantiation, at least the one that I generated when I was trying to write mine down, was that my worldview is about the values that I hold, um, which are the, some set of concepts that feel like they're consistent uh, you know, across my life and that are grounding my decision making. Like, like empirically, you observe yourself and you're asking, like, well, what values am I living out on a daily basis, right? Um, alongside you know, basically what do I think is worth doing? So like what goals make sense in light of my values? And in a lot of ways, these goals are asking, how do I align my world with my value system? In practice, um, there are like better and worse answers to that question. Um, but where another instantiation of worldview could look like uh, sort of like this philosophical worldview where you ask, well, like what do you think exists? Uh, at a fundamental level, um, every concept that we throw around um, is something that we are willing to think with and that we're like willing to imply exists for the purpose of deciding what to do and deciding how to communicate and how to act. Um, as well as, you know, like how do you think you can sort of reach truth? Where like scientific worldviews have um, sort of like wrested control from this, uh, you know, sense that for the most part people um, weren't at types of, like mystical worldview or, or religious worldviews where like the, the path to truth was about being in touch with the spirit or with something transcendent as opposed to uh, sort of grinding out, you know, some experiment, some set of experiments that will like let you do causal inference. And, you know, there's this tragedy in that, like, um, the paths to truth differ dramatically across domain. Where in some domains, it's not possible to do anything that looks like science, where you have a clean experimental method. And the attempts to extend science to those domains um, has been met with struggle and challenge. Or, or domains where, like, mathematics fails, you know, you've all of these chaotic or complex environments um, where we actually don't have models that officially predict whatever's happening in those domains. And in those contexts, you still have to make decisions. And so in practice, you end up with a path to truth that's much more heuristic. It's like, oh, well, this kind of worked in the past, so let's try it again. Or some you know, great leader tried to do it this way, and it worked once, so we're going to do it the exact same way over and over again. Um, but in the absence of quality paths to truth, it's very easy to get stuck in social feedback loops. And even in the context of science, you'll have you know, uh, something like Thomas Kuhn's paradigms, where there are a body of you know, like different socially accepted paths to accomplishing some goal. In like, the context of machine learning, say you like, have you know, connectionism, which is uh, you know, really, really where I sit. So Google Brain mostly works on deep learning, you know, along with sort of open AI and deep mind and a few like academic research labs. But many labs work on other forms of machine learning, which have very different philosophies around like what's likely to succeed and like around why they succeed. Um, so it's very clear that there's also sort of like sociological effects and something that's closer to um, the science. But outside of the context where you have like clear empirical feedback, it can well it can get really gross. So there's this version of worldview that's like, oh well, like what do you think exists? How do you think you get to truth? And what are your answers to foundational questions of meaning or worthiness or virtue or whatever? Um, I want to hear your thoughts on this. So, okay, yeah. where where it, it, it's of course it's not super uh, compartmentalized, like I'm about to describe it, but yeah. I want to know approximately how much weight you give every part of this aspect of worldview development, okay? okay. The, the lineage of ancestors that brought you into the world, mm -hmm. okay? And then let's say you're born, okay? So with those mm -hmm. genetics, the lineage of ancestor. Yeah, so like parents, grandparents, grand-grandparents. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, all of the, and all of the, the microbiome that 
and I oral biomes, all this stuff, right? Okay. <laughs> then I want to know how much weight you give that compared to how much weight you give maybe like the first couple years of the foundational infrastructures of your input stream being turned into your brain mm. and your understanding of the world, right? Yeah. And it's then developmental the, period. the developmental period and then the adolescent years and the adult years. Like, mm -hmm. do you put any of those at a higher weight than the others? Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, like, the natural response is that the preceding experience initializes the next, right? Mm -hmm. So from your ancestor, you will inherit some mechanism for deciding, and that can be much more powerful um, in that it's a generator of your future worldview than if you, if you take particular facts. Um, so, you know, if you're, say, like, raised with parents who like believe in sort of like scientific norms um you end up with a different sense of what the right path to truth is and so you know when you're like an adolescent or when you're an adult the way in which you decide to bring something in or to you know reject it uh, it will come out of the way you've been initialized right yeah. um so that said there are like you know portions of my life in which i feel like i've experienced faster growth and mm. i think that um they're pretty powerful transition periods that I can identify as like dramatic updates in my own thinking about what I should do or what's worthwhile or who I am. Um, and you can really like look at the life changing process um, as like being mediated by a few simple factors. So I've had a few instances where there were dramatic shifts in the people that I was around. An easy example is in my senior year at Harvard, I did what I called so systematic social exploration where um, there were huge numbers of people that were worth being around, and my search algorithm was, to like simply put, find the most, well, um, yeah, yeah, really like the most intellectual yeah. and uh, ambitious people yeah. that I could find. So like that intersection, and ask them, uh, you know, upon meeting them and like making that interaction like really growthful, um, who they thought the people that were like most likely to have this really dramatic long-term effect on humanity was. Mm. Um, and once you do that two or three times, you know, you say you find some great person, you ask them, oh, like who's you know likely to have this sort of powerful long-term impact? They give you three names. Say you find that person, you ask them, who do you think is like most likely to have this powerful long-term impact? Yeah, and they great. give you an answer. The very quickly. Process, you yeah. get to extraordinarily high-quality people, life-changing yes. people. Yes. And. Through that mechanism, I discovered um, Huge really amazing value through um, basically like meeting people whose whose value systems and whose worldviews and whose set of actions. This is had this so trend. so a mechanism like that can almost very simple mechanism. A very simple mechanism like that can almost put so much weight on your life trajectory that it can alter like even some of the foundational years of, of that mm -hmm. you, yeah, we're growing up. So, yeah. so this is the power of mm -hmm. mechanisms and this is a ma major part of that's what right. yeah, you care about as that's well. Right, which, that's right, that's right. Yeah, I love that mechanism. That one's, we like calling it also things like the hot 50, like make your list of the top 50 people that are like vertically networked, right? That are okay. more intellectual, more spiritually connected. Yeah, that yeah, and you can pick North whatever stars. access you want, right? Whatever access so, you want, yeah. the sense that the most spiritual person you know well, they'll have some most spiritual person that they know, and that person, like you can, you can use the mechanism um, for any objective. And there's this um, sense that there are exploration strategies that are undiscovered. And so one, you could take this mechanism and apply it, and it would probably work very well. But the second is you could realize that generating new mechanisms that are as powerful as this is an extraordinary path to social change, where Ideally, um, the mechanism can be instantiated in some system or in some structure and will basically work as an agent in and of itself, creating a society that's interestingly different than it, than it would be created in the absence of that mechanism. Yeah, I love that. <laughs> oh my gosh, all right. Um, let's, okay, let's continue moving on because there's so many things um, to, to unpack. Let's talk about abstraction um, as, as deeply as we can here. So with analogies, I think we have some really powerful analogies lined up here. Um, one of them is the way that we engage uh, with language. So why don't you um, take, I mean, as, an, as someone that literally is an interlocutor, mm -hmm. my job is to is to use, use is to use the abstraction with language. So yeah, yeah. you're talking, 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 talking. At the end, mm -hmm. I have parsed what you've said 
found the ab most abstract synthesis. Yeah, yeah. And I've left all of the the, the, the uh, and of which twos, right? Those That's words. Right. Yeah. And so, okay. So yeah, give us the yeah abstraction yes. language. So here's one thought you might enjoy is that um, a lot of languages basically taking advantage of association where when I use a word that word has been used by umpteen people before me and when they basically associated that word with whatever experience they were having that word started to acquire connotations or feelings that were associated with those experiences and so as a collective we are developing this collective conceptual scheme and every time somebody uses a concept, um, it will be associated with something, and they will start to feel differently about the concept insofar as that, that association is held. And so we stand here basically using this language, which has taken tons of like learning of sort of previous generations, yeah. as they basically create a conceptual scheme that's aligned with reality mm. and that allows for the making of progress, and that allows for the quick and concise description of whatever it is that we're engaging with. Mm. And internalizing that linguistic scheme um, can interpret with concepts things that would be extraordinarily difficult to model otherwise. Yeah. And so you can see this is sort of a collective representation. Um, but the tragedy is that if you're interested in volatility or in growth, um, everyone is now embedded in the exact same sort of large scale conceptual representation yes. and is forced to represent every object that they Correct. experience with the same words. With the so, same so, words. So um, where's the outliers? Where's the differences? Where's the mimetic parallax? Right, how do you escape is yeah. one thing. <laughs> Uh, where's the differences is, is great. So, yeah, so Lao Tzu would say, oh yeah, well, you know, the way that can be spoken is not the true way. Where there's the sense that the conceptual scheme is like insufficient or in the way of the, the descriptors of the experiences that are most worthwhile. And you'll often find that by, you know, engaging with something conceptually, you've nailed yourself down to a particular way of thinking about it, uh, which used to be amorphous and ungrounded and in its, you know, sort of potential, um, had sort of a larger space of possibility than after you concretized it with a particular set of, of phrases or ways of thinking about it. Um, and so in creativity, you would like to basically reject your conceptual scheme in some interesting way, and in undoing the assumptions that have yeah. been made by the collective representation, have a hope, have a chance of generating something new and valuable. Um, so I'm interested in the that creation of new concepts. Counterculture. Right? So, yes. yeah, exactly, yeah. exactly. I have a sense that um, countercultural tends to be reactionary, and it's one sort of easy way to be creative, which is sort of like, let's invert the value system mm. of whatever it is that we're interacting mm -hmm. with. And there are many, you know, many forms of counterculture, um, but it, if you invert in front of every single cultural experience you have, you have an automatic generator of very <laughs> different kinds of experience. Yeah. So you can see, um, you can see like Nietzschean master morality, or you can see Satanism as the sort of inversion of like canonical Christian values mm, mm. Um, as a generator of new religious systems or of new value systems. And there's this like you know interesting space of possible religious value systems that aren't lived out, but. Um, you could try to design new modes of feeling by asking, oh, well, here's the way that they choose to feel about all of these things. What if I did the exact opposite of what they do in the face of it? So instead of this sort of Buddhist, well, let's empty our minds of all thoughts, um, how do we induce a hypomania that is an extremely fast stream of thoughts, that is an extremely powerful and emotive yeah. stream of thoughts, yeah. and make that our, our practice as opposed to yeah. emptiness? So I guess like, um, there's a space of possibilities uh, that's exposed via inversion. Um, but I'd say that abstraction in language um, is funda foundational. So like, how do we get to these words or these concepts? Like, where do they come from? Um, well, often you will have some experience um, and then you'll have a very similar experience and you'll have a very similar experience. And if you attach the same label to all of those experiences, you can tie them to one another. Yeah, and that's why eight billion of us can, can, can talk about things like chairs and cars. And, exactly, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, you know, this chair, is usually defined functionally. It's like based on the way in which you sit in it. And it's similar to this chair, it's similar to that chair. Like every chair yeah. um, pulls in information from every other chair you've ever experienced ah. and lets you know exactly how to interact with it in a way that's, well, very, very useful, right? Yes, so um, yes, yes. there's this sort of uh, early form of conceptualization, which is the, the metaphor. So when you, when you make a metaphor, you say, oh, well, this thing is like that thing. I can point at this chair and say, oh, well, it's like that chair. Maybe you have different names for each chair, but it's like, it's like this, it's like that, it's kind of like this. Um, and it's inefficient 
to have to like sort of say the metaphor, oh, you know, it's kind of like a bookshelf, or it's kind of like this mm -hmm. or that or the other, uh, where you have specific names for all of those things yeah. over and over again. So eventually people will just create a new concept and they'll say, well, all of the things that are like that thing, I'm gonna call this, and they all have a word for it. And that word will let people seamlessly do transfer across everything that's labeled with that word. Like a neologism for a chair that can also double as a bed. I, I so something like that. Is, yeah, yeah. So simultaneously. We can add words to the vocab that for, for objects that can be redesigned and repurposed and stuff. Yeah. Um, so there's two, there's two things here I think that are really critical. One of the things is that it's, it's, it's thanks to the 100 plus billion humans before us that slowly but surely <laughs> figured out yes. how to communicate, yeah, uh, build right. a language yeah. that we're super grateful for. And also that it's all about relationships the relationships between the words that we say, the relationships between the objects that we have, between the humans. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so that's such a critical component of this. Yeah, I feel that. So like every sentence is usually, here are some entities that exist, and here's how they relate to one another. And ideally, you'd find a nice way to represent the, the, the objects and the relations between them um, in a way that, that was searchable or experienceable. Um, I have a sense that like, for most sentences, there's a nice mathematical relationship that you can see the sentence as representing. Um, whether it's, you know, if you, if you look at this variable, this variable in increases, this other variable, it'll go, it'll go up or it'll go down. And we talk about you know, how to improve things by saying, oh, well, actually, if you improve this thing, this other thing will improve. And there's a simplistic causal relationship between the two variables that we described. Um, you know, we hope that like time spent lifting like increases the like amount of muscle mass, increases you know the amount of weight that you can lift. Um, you see association after association after association. We believe it, right? And so someone can convey to you that concept. That's like, oh, well, how do I increase this this object or this number? Or how do I um, accomplish this task? And they'll describe a set of relations to you. Um, oh well, take this object, perform this operation. Take this object, perform this operation, and you'll see your number go up. Um, and often these relationships are complex, like, you know, they're, say they're quadratic, where if you go some distance, it gets worse, but if you go farther, it gets better. Yeah, yeah. And as soon as you introduce the simplest nonlinearity, mm. um, mm. your ability to describe the relationship, it starts to decay, where you can't say uh -huh. that mm. in a very simple way. Simple way. And, um, That's why you use math, like you said, a quadratic yeah, equation. Yeah, exactly, right? exactly. Um, but you have like many different concepts that all point to this, um, whether it's the sort of adaptive valley, right? Mm -hmm. So you know you change mm -hmm. a little bit, and yeah. it, you know you end up in the valley, and you're like, oh well, that change must be bad. But uh -huh. the inference might just be an assumption that there's a linear relationship between what you're mm -hmm. changing mm -hmm. and the thing that you're trying to get to. Correct. And if you pushed farther, you would realize that yeah. uh, out of the valley, there's there's much more yeah. than you'd expect it. Yes. And so people get into all of these sort of terrible beliefs because. Um, they'll make some simple assumption about a relationship where they tried something, they got worse, they tried something, it was painful, it was hard, and the feedback loops aren't fast enough. Mm. Where like, you know, dieting is a wonderful example of this sort of slow feedback loop. You know, maybe you feel better mm. in, you know, three or four days or in, in weeks or in a month. Um, being too slow, and so because they don't see the feedback immediately, they assume that their actions aren't having a strong impact. And it's, well, it's not just intellectual, it's visceral, where they're, um, their visceral, visceral experiential response to it is in this dopaminergic loop, and if the dopamine's not triggered and, and isn't clearly like sort of credit assigning to the thing that they had done, um, they don't want to do it. And so, yeah. um, I guess like across the spectrum of human behavior, you have this this really physically instantiated mathematical assumption that, that in umpteen cases inc is incorrect, and, and that manifests as like this large scale behavioral control problem. Yeah, <laughs> we're gonna get to that behavioral control problem um, in a little bit too as we talk um, about the um, compressing how to learn and compressing execution. Um, okay, but let's hit this on the way. Um, temporal abstraction, mm -hmm. abstraction of time, because this is some, there's two examples here that I just wanna bring up. Um, yeah. One of them is that when we plan things like this show starting, you know, us, you arriving at six o'clock, it was at, you know, that means six-ish. It doesn't mean 602 and 42 seconds, you know, et cetera. Yeah. So we have things, and it's like you were, like you retorted to me before we started, like you wouldn't show up 30 minutes or 60 minutes late, mm -hmm. right? Things like that. Yeah. Um, so we have that abstraction of time, but I think an even more interesting abstraction of time for some reason is our salience. Our, our, our understanding of salience with time, because I feel as though uh, in 
uh, after one day of life, you really remember maybe the best thing from that day. After a month of life, you remember the best thing from that month. After a whole life, how many best things do you remember after a whole life? That's, that's yeah, that's real. There's a, so Kahneman will sort of point at this sort of peak end rule. Which I think it failed to replicate, but basically the parts of an experience that you remember are some small subset of the entire experience. Um, yeah, there's a sense that memory has to grapple with time in this way. And in part, it's tragic that there aren't like nice ways to refer to your memory at different points in time. But basically, um, like it's a very efficient system for decision making. Where if you had to, to remember every single two week period in, the, in your past as if it was the last two weeks, oh, yeah. there wouldn't be capacity. Yeah. And so our mind has to find ways to deal with these foundational limitations around how efficiently it can do information processing. And it tends to abstract as a response to the sense that there's this huge amount of information from which it could draw the entirety of your life experience. And it somehow has to compress that experience in a way that can direct your action right now. And so in a given moment, you have a few, say, slots in working memory, and there's very little space there, right? Seven and, plus or minus two? Um, yeah, well, depending that's... on how, what kind of objects you're dealing with. Okay. Sure, sure, sure. Um, in the case of numbers, I think that's a decent example. Mm -hmm. And basically, um, the need to compress every bit of information that's relevant to some mental operation is uh, it's just really damning for our ability to make high quality decisions in umpteen contexts where maybe there are like 16 relevant facts, but you can only think about three or four of them simultaneously. Or there are creative solutions, but they require the integration of five different complex parts. And you can't hold five in your mind at the same time. You can only hold two in your mind at the same time. Um, I think there are umpteen mathematical problems that are actually trivial if you can fit all five like, you know, objects, all five variables in, and their relationships in memory at the same time. But if you ever can't get to that number, it's almost impossible to solve the problem. And so, um, so one question is, like, how do we create effective source, sort of, sources of external memory, which will let us mm. um, continue to make decisions on the basis of more information than we're capable of processing in a given moment? And this and is pretty good at doing the externalizing of memory, yeah, yeah. but it doesn't make the association. That's right, that's right. Yeah. And if you want to be creative, you have to hold them in your mind simultaneously. And so I guess one important uh, sort of valuable proposition in creating creative intelligent machines is that there are umpteen solutions that are right on sort of the horizon of our working memory's ability to generate those solutions. But because of sort of fundamental limitations, humans aren't capable of, of thinking the slightly higher dimensional thought. And if you like relax that limitation, um, there's a huge amount of creative action that, that could come spur immediately. Um, there are like umpteen concepts that my algorithms will learn on a daily basis that I would never have discovered, in part because I don't know how to attend to multiple parts of like, an image simultaneously. Or I don't know how to attend to huge amounts of sort of information in a corpus simultaneously in a way that would let me integrate that information with you know, the other parts of it. And so when we design an algorithm, let's say is doing transfer um, from one situation to another. You know, it learns in one domain and it tries to generalize to another domain. Um, and it's combining umpteen parts of the things that it's learned in generating its solutions. Um, there's this creative interface for problem solving that feels much more powerful, or more, more potent um, on the axis of working memory. Um, but in human creativity, as is also obviously deeply important, the expansion of working memory um, comes out of abstracting properly. Yes. Where if you take some complex idea you've been struggling with, um, that you've seen in many places, a pattern you've seen in many places, and you turn it into a word, that yeah. word will acquire much less space in working memory, and will also start to accumulate associations as you begin to use it. Maybe like and the word fractal, because that, ha that has so many world, well, so, yeah, well, world The thing is like potential. recursion, is one of the most powerful concepts conceivable, where self-reference is one of the few things um, that toppled this sort of beautiful abstract mathematical systems that we had. So like Gottlieb Frank writes down this beautiful algebra, and like there's all these notions of self-reference. Um, they, they create infinities that, that undo like, mm -hmm. the most powerful systems we've created. Um, but yeah, fractal and, and recursion, like, it's hard to point at these things without you know, a word that says, oh, well, here it is in this context, here it is in that context, yeah, here yeah, it is in this yeah. other context. All of them share the exact same mathematical structure. And 
I guess that I have uh, an appreciation um, for, for the creation of a new concept that efficiently lets you yes. interact it with other concepts. And so when you hit the limitations of your working memory, um, you try to compress your information yeah. in a new and hopefully interesting and predictive way. Yes. Um, yes. Which will let you generate ideas that couldn't have been thought before. Like one yes. simple, simple like, I want to generate something that's never been thought is I'm going to create three or four new concepts um, that, you know, you'd say it took a book to describe, but that is a simple pattern that you can see in multiple places. And in thinking with them simultaneously, will be almost guaranteed to think thoughts that have never been thought before. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and we're gonna get to that towards um, the creativity at the end. I wanna um, also make sure that people know, so um, within the links um, that are in the bio, there's, uh, you have so much breakdown of these modeled systems. Um, oh, yeah. yeah, yeah, and um, one of them that I thought was really interesting was the actual uh, breakdown of the properties of abstraction. Conceptual rather than concrete, general rather than specific, a mm -hmm. compressed representation, like mm -hmm. you were just saying. An abstraction has a hierarchical co compression mm -hmm. uh, that the lower level objects don't get the, the attention in the That's space, right. but that the synthesis is due. That's right. Yeah. So what I offered was eight definitions of the exact same concept. And what tends to happen is people will offer one definition of a concept that people have defined in many different ways. And in confusing those definitions for one another, they actually won't be able to know what one another is describing or talking about. And often the definitions will be contradictory. So one thing I do in the book is basically, um, with each definition, say a way, I, I give an example of abstraction that violates the definition. And mm -hmm. so you'll find that most definitions of words are um, sort of reaching for the fact that the word is actually uh, used in many interestingly different ways and has a connotation, acquires a connotation, and is actually this very high dimensional, like simultaneous, like a word is a felt sense, like a, a way of feeling about the thing, as well as a particular fact about the thing, um, as well usually as like many sort of different definitions of whatever it's representing. Um, in giving all of the definitions, you can attain conceptual clarity. And when you get to clarity about what's being said or what's being thought, um, it's possible to make progress. And I think so much progress is actually well. You have a concept that conflates many different positions and people will just talk past one another. And I think that a quality example of this is this free will debate that yeah. people will have <laughs> over, over and over and over again, where they actually have instantiated this concept in very different ways from one another. And they switch between the definitions. Yeah, yeah, and they don't yeah. know that they're switching. Mm. And um, mm. there's this beautiful uh, article on the, sort of the Mott Bailey problem mm. in debates mm. Mm. where people will have, you know, the very defensible version of their idea. Um, and then the like sort of, you know, version they really hold, but much less defensible version. Mm. Um, and people will attack the, you know, expansive version of the idea. And they'll say, oh, no, 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 it's only this definition. And then as soon as the, you know, the people go away, they say, oh, actually, it also means all of these other things. Um, and with concepts that are like, you know, you abusing abstraction and that they're conflating unlike things with one another, um, it's very easy to say, oh, well, you know, here's you know, my, my you know, religious scheme or system. Um, and it'll have all of these consequences and someone will be like, oh, well, like, what about this, what about that? If they question it, you'll say, oh, actually, it's just this one thing that is very defensible. Um, and often it's like possible to do useful emotional work that way. But I think many debates, uh, like fights that people have, look a lot like this. Yeah, um, and this is this can be some of the issues with having a sp single word um, like free will or like a simulation or uh, or like substrate or whatever the words yeah. are. It's just that it, it's and you add power to the word by by adding different implementations of it, by, by basically making it more expansive. And that's what you did with breaking down abstraction into the eight definitions. Yeah, that's right. And so I, I agree that this is a really great way to do it. Actually, that should be one of the things that's listed on Wikipedia pages for these things. Like, I think it's actually listed yeah. on, you know, multiverse, right? So multiverse, yeah. and then you see like Max Tegmark's breakdown of it. And I think there's like another, um, maybe Brian Greene's breakdown of it, right? So there's, right. Th and which is actually really helpful because then that's yes. the levels of, of, of definitions of that and abstraction. Okay, let's hit on the word uh, transfer for us. Uh, allows for efficient modeling and learning, where upon encountering a situation, an intelligent being or system can bring patterns seen in data and problems from the past to bear on the new situation. And you, right. you like, I love this part, moving an idea out and across domains. I, that's such a, 
such a critical thing, like the anti-disciplinary. That's right. It's the creation of the unity of knowledge in umpteen ways, where there's this vague realization that the boundaries between these domains are really somewhat arbitrary. And mathematics is the front and center example of a place where you'll define a relationship and it has a shape or it has a form. And that relationship will exist in umpteen academic disciplines. And the failure to do transfer from, say, the properties of that function to those other disciplines is a tragedy. So I think um, McNeil's Lassie and Taleb is a, a beautiful example mm -hmm. of taking a very simple idea. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, so he has anti-fragile, yeah. but, but he also is fooled by randomness in the black swan. Yeah, yeah. And in the black swan, for example, he will um, describe a situation where there's a power law distribution that is, um, there are extremes, and the extremes that are the outliers, they are really, really large, yeah. which, you know, has the, his example is obviously the financial crisis. Yes. Um, but there are umpteen examples of these power law distributed domains, you know, like the amount of money that is made by individuals is mm -hmm. another good example, mm -hmm. where because of the properties of that distribution, you can actually say that it makes sense to act very differently in the face of that distribution than, than if you have some normally distributed outcome like height, right? Um, so what he does is take a very simple statistical principle, sort of the normal distribution, and you know, in the abstract, the distributional assumption that is made, um, and he contrasts it with this power law distribution, and he shows that in three or four different areas in social science and economics, you know, in these disciplines, um, when you look at data, and data has this form, you have to draw dramatically different conclusions. So he has extremistan versus mediocristan. So mm -hmm. the, the world where there are complex interactions and where um, there basically are power law distributed outcomes versus the world where there are simple interactions. Um, and I think that this, uh, this idea in probability theory is very general, but almost every idea in probability theory is that general, where you can see probability and statistics as meta-science, in that like our, our practical epistemology is saying, oh, well, this is true statistically. You know, We've seen it many times in the past. We're looking at a similar distribution now. We expect to be able to generalize. And where the, the answers to the problem of induction are like, when can we generalize from the past to the future, um, is the problem of these statistical tools or of machine learning and is how we come to truth. Mm -hmm. And so in every domain where we think we believe things that are true, the standards for evidence look statistical. And often these probab probabilistic models um, have implications. And so I see him as doing the work of taking this one idea um, out and across domains. Yes. And there is a huge amount of work, you know, intellectual cognitive work yeah. um, that could be done taking, well, certainly like every major idea in probability theory out, out and across domains, but also in mathematics and, the, and in the sciences, and Even in there's the spiritual criticism. domain and in the interconnectedness of I think especially, yeah, yeah, that's yeah, right. Yeah. Um, like often, like the way that spiritual people will use abstraction in order to create power inside of their concepts, like, like the sense of awe that comes from looking at the generality of a concept. Um, it's very powerful. So, so often, you know, like you read about dualism in the I Ching. You know, they have the yin versus the yang. There are all of these like sort of like high abstract. Like this applies to almost everything you've ever experienced. <laughs> like chaos and order. Like yeah, these yeah. very high level concepts, right? Yeah. And um, the beautiful thing is when you learn something mm -hmm. about a concept that's very very general. Yeah. It applies to umpteen situations. And you get to feel the power of the update to umpteen aspects of your worldview simultaneously. Yes, oh, and it's so beautifully it becomes, said. It becomes so difficult to interact with improvements to your worldview that are local, and that feel merely local. Yeah, yeah. And <laughs> so you have to experience them as the concrete abstract. So a particular example has to be an example of a more general principle. And in updating the general principle, you experience an update across all of your experience. Oh, and that's so beautiful. The, Gosh, the way that a really powerful update, a general update, can just update your worldview across domains because it's in a, that's right. a very applicable Every time I learn general. something about heavy tail distributions. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, 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 seriously, yeah, yeah seriously. seriously. Yeah, power laws, all this type. Yeah, it's incredibly these, powerful. Or yin and yang, like the, these types of things. That's right. Yeah, the beauty of like the interconnects. Uh, let's, I know, I know, we have still so much to talk about, but, but, but I want to But this is hit, the power of yeah. representation, where if okay. you represent your world, in a way that makes these updates mm. easily accessible and yeah. possible, yeah. then everything is fascinating and it's correct for it to feel fascinating. Yeah, yeah. And that's so critical. It's like being in awe. I love it. Um, okay, let's hit 
On, um, let's hit That's on religious, these. by the way. Yeah. The feeling of awe that you're feeling. Yeah, it's spiritual. Yeah, because you feel the heights and the, well, generality, right? And um, they will depend on that mechanism over and over and over again to create yes. the feeling of scale and awe. It's like the way that Christ is all things, the way that yes. um, you know God is seen, is the creator of this, that, and the other. The use of infinity. Anyway, sorry. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. Okay, very, okay. <laughs> so much. Um, all right. These things are are these things kind of fit together. Um, one of the aspects of we mentioned this earlier, but mm. just that as as in the machine intelligence age that we. Uh, <clears throat> are using the um, the the appendages that are kind of outside of us for now, like computers for mm -hmm. now, mm -hmm. um, we want to make them more associative. Um, also, the appendages will soon be inside of us, and so it potentially, mm -hmm. we'll see what ends up happening. But um, I want to know compressing how to learn and compressing execution. Yeah. This is extremely important, especially in today's attention economy of beep, boop, pop, 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 pop just like mm -hmm. always getting binged, 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 and also the business models around the attention economics. So to be able to actually focus, to be able to follow on momentum as you're already going and just stay hyper-focused in that, um, yeah. to go counterculture to social norms, um, actually focused and um, diffuse thinking, they kind of remind me of uh, mm -hmm. sparse versus dense rewards oh, that's cute. in reinforcement learning. That's cute. <laughs> so, um, that, cause that was just from yesterday with Todor. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, um, high dimensional versus low dimensional. Yeah, yeah. That's, I mean, there is plenty of shared structure. You can talk about There's it. So much shared um, structure, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, so I think that compressing learning and compressing execution are examples of attempts on my end to build a concrete model of every major system that I engage with. And there's this huge diff when you come to a situation having already written down everything that you think about that thing. Where now if I learn something about learning, it's not as if I'm engaging with that space for the first time. I actually can add it to this comprehensive sort of set of knowledge that I built about how to learn effectively. Mm -hmm. And when someone comes to me and is like, oh well, you know, in our education system, here's our process, I can say, here are 15 principles of how to learn effectively yes. that if you implemented simultaneously would almost certainly lead to a dramatic change in somebody's ability to learn whatever it is that they're working on. Um, and so I think of it basically like writing down what you think about like every you know major domain that you interact with over and over and over again is a very efficient way to build a worldview. And that's the and spaced repetition to let's hit that slide while we're while yeah. we're here too. Yeah. And that's the fourth one. So I would like to, to um, basically have my knowledge build on itself over time. Yes. As opposed to, via the sort of vicissitudes of memory, fall out of my, my worldview um, just because I've forgotten it. And 15 principles of how to learn, compressing how yeah, to learn, can right. potentially, does actually literally rocket one's trajectory upward in terms of their ability to Fall at, follow a North Star and execute on that. Yeah, really and doing yeah. things like um, spaced repetition is what holds on to, and this is one of the principles. Yeah, that's yeah. right. So I guess um, my learning process, at least for textbook reading, was typically I would sit down with a timer. I would make sure that uh, I, in reading each page, wasn't taking more than like five to six minutes per page. So this is a technical books, you know, a book like you know, machine learning and pattern yeah, recognition. Yeah, yeah. yeah like, oh, machine learning text. There's a lot cool. of sort text of on the on each page that's really small. Uh, like, yeah, well, yeah, yeah, very scary. Yeah. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. Um, and I would, first of all, rewrite everything that I read. Damn. So you, Damn. you, you read a page and you think you know what was on the page, but you find very quickly, if you try to write down what was on the page, that you didn't hold huge amounts of it in memory. You didn't see some of it. And when you try to reconstruct it, that's revealed to you. Yes. So this, um, this ability to rewrite what's on the page also forces you to pay attention in the first place. Yes. And then you compare what you wrote to what actually exists afterwards, and you realize, oh, well, um, here are all of the holes in my ability to read. So I feel like I was in practice learning how to read yeah. um, for the first time in a lot of ways, right? Because you yeah. read and you think that you know what's there. That's there, yeah. And you, uh, you, know, you talk to someone and they ask you, oh, like, what did you read? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> It depends, because you can actually get a synthesis of a book mm -hmm. that if you can say to the author, yeah. and they would just be like, 
that was better than what I wrote on my book jacket. Yeah, and that's, that's right. And yeah, that, hap that happens. That if happens. You take, if you yeah. take it seriously, yes, that yeah. absolutely happens if you take it seriously. And that's beautiful. We've had a guest that sat down after we read their bio, and they're like, yeah. "I'm going to use that as my bio." <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's like a better version. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I have um, an appreciation for reconstruction. So basically, like, I like reading this textbook uh, for say two and a half hours each morning. Um, will like write this document and in the reconstructing it will like have written hundreds of pages, which is basically like the textbook, but in my own words, right? Yeah. Um, and there's a stickiness to that uh, that's hard to get from sort of just like reading straight up. And especially in the absence of exercises. Like so doing exercises is super, super important. You're some, synthesizing some books don't every page and then uh, you're yeah. and comparing you it to what you was there. You read and you write what you read. And, and it's like, then it's like not that complicated. And then that whole process happens over a chapter. Then it happens over right. the entire book. Right. And then what you do. So not only are you and doing, then you put it, you in, get a, you put what you learned in the Anki. Yeah, yeah. You're doing a first reminder from reading it, a second reminder from writing it. Then you're doing a right. third reminder when you take that and you look at it the next day. Yeah, yeah. And then you do a fourth reminder when later that day you teach Alan yeah, about it. So that's wonderful, actually. And then yeah, that's a fire wire, fire wire. You're like really remembering. And that way you actually have information retention versus the forgetting curve when you don't have these little fire wire reminders on super, the Super, super critical. critical. Also, um, the best thing to do is read something you're going to use in your future and in using it, get another set of hits. So I'll read a machine learning textbook and then implement the algorithms that I read about. Yes. And yes. it's a much more detailed and really like unfalsifiable like version of the algorithm. Like you can't lie about whether your code is working or not. And so that's mm -hmm. a sort of concrete representation of your understanding, um, instantiated in code that, um, that feels very grounded. Okay, and this is one of the most important things for those that are viewing right now to retain is that you are really pursuing your North Stars, you're pursuing finding meaning in life, whatever you find that to be, make sure to repeat, do the spaced repetition of that content that you're reading, that you're analyzing, that you're learning and implementing into your essence on a spaced repetition process so that you can most effectively achieve these dreams that you set out for. On creativity, mm. You had such a good podcast conversation on this subject. Um, generating ideas, and we have another asset for systemizing creativity. Um, this is uh, what is your the logo, right? Mm -hmm. Is this the logo? The creation. Persist the moment of creation. The moment of creation. That's right. There's so many things here that you were teaching me that things like, first of all, the importance of memetics. Uh, the ideas propagating across mm -hmm. networks is so critical. Um, things like uh, having time constraints. So, like if you yes. if you say every morning ten minutes, I'm going to write down ten ideas. Okay, you only get two ideas down, and then there's only two minutes left. The sure. amount of force by yeah, your time is running out. By time. You have to come up with more. Yeah, yeah, and you start to engage this this creative state of mind, right? Because once the ideas start to flow or start to come. Um, there's, there's the sense that there's a trigger or a point at which it's natural and flowing, and you'll hit a vein of creative ideation where the ideas are somewhat similar to each other, but back, piggybacking. Um, and you end up in this really excited state because you're looking at something that hadn't existed before. Um, but it's, it's really uh, reasonable to think of most mental processes um, as being similar to physical processes where you could train it if you had some quality training regimen. And where creativity is a skill in that there are a set of mental motions that yeah. you make that generate valuable creative ideas. And if you can engage that state of mind over and over and over and over again, as if you are a creative yeah. athlete yes. training for this creative yes. Olympics, yes. Yes. you would be capable of performing at a much higher level, basically problem solving much more effectively, flexibly, creatively um, than almost anybody else, right? So I guess. Um, it's, it's in part about idea flow um, and building up a lifestyle really around creative ideation in my, in my life. But I, um, I think that it's also not that costly, where in 10 minutes a day, by generating 10 ideas against the target, um, you mm -hmm. will be substantially more generative, certainly than you were before, um, and will have the ability to, in the face of any problem, say, well, I can sit here and in 10 minutes generate 10 different paths or 10 different plans, all of which would basically lead me to, to my goal or would be a solution. And that ability to be generative um, in the face of a problem is what looks like sort of resourcefulness in this sort of startup ecosystem yeah. um, is 
really like what opens up pathways that are 10 times or 100 times more efficient yeah. than the pathway that, that you would go on by default. Yep. And which breaks you out of social mores. So, yes. so it's very easy to complain about the default way of thinking about something. And that's fine, but if you have the ability to generate nine non-default ways think of thinking about that same problem, um, then it'll, it'll feel natural, actually, to be frustrated with the social equilibrium. There's yeah. so many mechanisms like this. And, and one of them is this basically idea jam that you do in, in the morning and just mm -hmm. 10 ideas in 10 minutes. That's mm -hmm. a profound one. Mm -hmm. This actually goes all the way back to like Thomas Edison. This yeah, was yeah. such a cool point that he would fall asleep with a rock that's right, in that's his right. hand. And then as he's falling asleep, the rock would fall, wake him up, and he would be in part potentially REM sleep or deep sleep, and then right. he would be in kind of that partly sleepy, partly, where you have an interesting amount of abstract creative synthesis happening, That's right. and, then you, and then as you wake up, you go, oh, I'm gonna write that down, I'm gonna, I'm gonna execute on that, yeah. That's right. That's right. <laughs> I think we all have the moment of like, as you're falling asleep, you like jump up and you run to, what well, cause you're thinking about the problem, right? Yes. And you start to enter this hypnagogic in between sleep and, and wakefulness state of mind, where umpteen of the constraints that force your representation of reality to be rational or reasonable, those constraints start to loosen. Yeah. And so people consistently have the experience of like while dreaming, being able to conceive of things that would have been inconceivable in daily life. And it's because when you're in wakefulness, uh, you basically are engaged with a bunch of constraining mechanisms that stop you from thinking particular kinds of thought that are misaligned. Because the truth is that the mind that generates your experiences while you're dreaming is the exact same mind that generates your experience of day-to-day -day reality. And there is this a sort of flexibility in the space of things your brain can represent um, that's strongly curtailed by uh, basically the need to engage with reality in a concrete way on a concrete basis. Um, so this, this uh, sense that you can engage with that state intentionally and use it to generate creative ideas um, is part of what is sort of called diffuse mode thinking. Where your, your brain will go yeah. into a default, default mode, right? So you want um, the mind wandering, you know, the, the open-ended walk, yes. you know, like the sitting in the shower experience. And you want um, to prep, you want to prime before your walk and before your shower by like yeah. looking at think these abstracts. Think about abstract. your problem for, for yeah. 20 minutes and then go for a walk. Yeah. And think about your problem for 20 minutes and, and then go, not go take with, a shower. And not right? with headphones on your walk and not... That's right, where yeah, your attention yeah. is un, uh, on, yeah, un, on ungrounded. Your, yeah, exactly, ungrounded. exactly. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, and it's like creativity hacking. It's so beautiful. Uh, yeah, I think... Upgrading, that, enhancing, yeah, um, yeah. I know, I think that a lot of them do feel like hacks. So, you know, your, your brain happens to work this way. So act in such and such a way and you'll get the outcome that you want. Mm -hmm. um, I think that that... Is, is pretty accurate where you say, we have some understanding of the system, we can like force you know, us, ourselves into this, this, this path and we'll, we'll be more generative. Um, so some of it looks like default mode. Like, I think that if people just took showers more, like, you know, like water use be the end. And uh, blessing the spirit of giving us the water to be able to drink <laughs> and, to, nature, and right. to bathe in, yeah. That's right, that's blessing right. it, yeah. Uh, that's a critical that, part of this process. That yes. they would be more generative and they basically are like engaging with mind states that um, consistently produce uh, like high quality and new ideas. Yes. Consistently. Yes. Consistently. The mechanisms yeah. that can launch our trajectory upward faster. These yeah. mechanisms, like you mentioned with the worldview updating, like you're mentioning with creativity hacking. That's like right. these mechanisms are so crucial. Yeah. Something that, oh, go ahead. I just yeah. wanted, I want to, I just wanted to say, it's just such a fascinating way of perceiving the world through you, like vicariously through your worldview right now. Mm. Yeah, that's like partly yeah, what I think. Yeah, you feel that. Yeah, yeah. It's yeah. beautiful. It's and like your. The, so, so that's part yeah, of systematizing yeah. creativity. So there are 16 elements. One is uh, basically ask if I was in the mind of this other person, yes, this, yes. Co this identity, right? So if I was an economist, what would I say? If I was a mathematician, what would I yes, say? Yes. If I was, you know, Alan, what would I say? If I was Peter Thiel, mm -hmm. if I was Elon Musk, mm -hmm. if I was Donald Trump, what would I do? Mm -hmm. And how would I solve my problem? There's this um, sense that we can model other minds and, you know, it's internal. It's like inside our mind is a little simulator of the other person. And if you engage with that simulator and ask what they would say, it generates a very different response than your response which is super interesting since like, it's all happening inside your head, um, but it's super useful if you want different perspectives to generate creative ideas in the face of your problem. Um, and asking what you know, every major academic field would say about your problem 
basically does transfer from the concepts, the conceptual schemes in those academic fields. So you know, if the economist is thinking in terms of incentives and in terms of deadweight loss yes, and in yes, terms yes. of marginality and resources and resource constraints um, and principal agent problems in game theory, like bringing in those concepts to your problem gives you very different solutions than engaging with the statistician's notion of, of variance and of bias and of, of the distribution that represents the objects. And like, there's, there's, I guess there are all of these conceptual schemes which have predictive power in umpteen contexts um, that you can bring to bear on your problem, on your situation, or whatever it is that you're thinking about. Um, one, of the, so, one of the best things that we can do, I think, is to be able to abstractly reason a bunch of worldviews at the same time. That's right, and you have this ensemble model. Yeah, oh, so sorry. Ensemble, the mosaic yeah, yeah. Exactly, ensemble. Exactly. Um, because then what you're doing is you're seeing how somebody from the African continent, from the Europe area, from the yeah, South yeah. American area, or China, Asian area of the world, sees that's a specific right. issue, That's right. and then and if you can abstract reason different. it. Yeah. Well, someone that's old, someone that's young, someone that's poor, someone that's, that's right. rich. That's right, that's right. Yeah, and then. And they come up with totally different solutions. And then th 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 that's it, the creativity is one component, but then also yeah, th the it's interesting. Someone, some people say that, oh, is that kind of schizophrenic a little bit? So that mm -hmm. word is so uh, strangely, has so much bad connotation, but I think that it is kind of schizophrenic to be balancing all of these different worldviews at the same time. Um, and uh, yeah, not weird. necessarily, which one is a reality when there's 8 billion views on reality? So this is a tough, this is a tough thing to be able to figure out, well, water is a certain molecular structure, so we can probably objectively agree that it is that, yeah. and so I'll, things I'll like this. people say reality is intersubjective truth, yeah. Things like that. Yeah. Okay, for our second episode, we'll, we'll dive deeper into uh, more of this. Couple quick questions on the way out. Mm -hmm. This has been so awesome. Um, what do you think happens pre-birth and post-death? Interesting. Um, so, I, there's a materials reductivist answer. I don't know if that's the one that you're interested in. Um, there's this um, sense that time, as we've represented it with modern physics, is um, well, it's like presented us with a lot of issues. So one is its reversibility. Um, two is this question of like whether, say, the, the reality we're in was generated simultaneously. Um, that is, are all times um, basically static in some external world, um, or whether it's being like fluidly generated. Um, so. And yeah, I guess, like, well, there's a sense that, like, we are a part of the universe, um, and so everything that we do uh, is basically interacting with other parts of our universe, um, and, like, things interacted with, like, things previously in order to generate us. Mm -hmm. um, so there's a question of, like, oh, well, like, what is identity, and, like, uh, what does it mean for me to continue to exist? There are ways in which I stop continuing to exist, certainly, like, um, in our reality, upon death. There are ways in which what I do is, is like, you know, echoing in eternity, you know, the style of gladiator and this, um, this sort of like want for a legacy or to live on. Um, and denial of death is this powerful generator of meaning. Mm. Um, mm. But the hope in part is like to, you know, make like, you know, like anti-aging and like longevity and life extension happen um, in a way that like sort of stops the sort of abhorrent sense that death is ever present. Um, but obviously, like our, you know, our fear and frustration of death is, in, like, in part a function of us being these evolved creatures that, um, mm -hmm. well, like, don't like it when our, our line gets cut. Um, so. Okay. Next question. Yeah. Are we? Let's, um, yeah, we're on. Let's retire that question. <laughs> oh, we'll. Oh, we'll. We'll have to. We'll have to talk about that then. Yeah. We'll have to talk didn't, about that. didn't I already give you my two cents on that? I don't think it's really important what happens before or what happens after, because all we know is right now. That that question is more like none of our business. And like uh, what Jeremy mentioned on, um, you know, we're extending life and we want to stop the aging process. You know, we're just we're just going to celebrate what we know. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter where you come from or where you're going. I think it totally matters. The birthplace. That's where, where we disagree. Where you enter into this beautiful spiritual experience of being a human, that that location matters, and then the journey matters, and then the ending matters, the whole process. It's all matters. a random chance on a wicked deck of cards, weaving serpents. Or the other alternative is that it's extremely meaningful and you had already decided the lessons that you were coming in here to learn. There's a lot of also spiritual um, thoughts about that. 
Okay, are we alone in the cosmos? Uh, yeah, I think that it's, well, unlikely statistically, but it's hard to say exactly what the parameters should be. And our model of whether or not we're alone is updating dramatically over time, where we'll encounter new concepts. So I think like, one very powerful um, concept simulation is an indicator that it's possible for us to receive very powerful updates to how we think our world has been created That's and right. to what our world is constituted of. Yes. And I think that the only place it makes sense to be is on the side of this vast array of unknown unknowns mm -hmm. where I expect our conceptual scheme, that is the way that we interpret our reality, to change dramatically, certainly in the face of more powerful intelligences capable of representing the world in ways that we can't imagine, and that it would be somewhat arrogant to assume that like this particular you know, uh, truth is definitely the case, and so mm -hmm. um, you know, I'm going to like make permanent decisions on its basis. Mm -hmm. uh, it's very important to be sufficiently meta and update in the, in the face of new evidence and expect there to be dramatic and interesting new evidence. Um, so a concept that, it, that followed on from simulations, so I guess uh, you know, both Sherman and Robin Hanson are like, doing amazing mm -hmm. work in the space. One of Robin's ideas is this, this great filter mm -hmm. is a very fascinating concept totally. asking, um, where are we? Um, and so you know, we don't see you know, life on other planets. Does that mean that it's likely that we're likely to you know, say, if we have some form of existential risk, kill ourselves before we reach the scale of civilization that we think we would naturally reach? Um, that concept didn't really exist, say, 10 to 20 years ago. Um, we didn't think in those terms. And so I expect us to both generate like, new and fascinating concepts, but also like, new technical paradigms um, in which we could conceive of ourselves having been created, where like mm -hmm. computer science and like quality computers is relatively recent. And in the absence of that frame, um, it's hard to say imagine simulationism. And well, I don't know, we have this, this sort of creator god of umpteen so sort of spiritual religions. And the similarity between simulation and creationism, um, mm -hmm. those similarities are like apparent, right? Huge. So in some yeah. senses, we had many concepts that that sort of simulationism like, sort of bears on or relies on um, for a long, long time. Um, but in a lot of ways, it's like a very new way of conceiving of things. And you know, if there had been like a different ordering to the way technologies were invented, uh, maybe we would have had computation before we had physics, and physics would be based in computation, and we would have, well, um, sort of simulation much earlier than it, it happened to come, something like it. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I see this sort of conceptual progress um, as having dramatic turns, and I expect there to be more dramatic turns in the future. And do you think this is a simulation? I would put the preponderance of my weight on, um, basically, this is a concept that I actually don't currently have. And in the face of conceptual progress, maybe humans will end up with a concept of what it is that exists. Mm. But there are umpteen foundational unsolved problems, certainly in the, sort of the nature of information um, and in the space of ways in which worlds can be created um, that make me think that, well, um, one frame is that, oh, well, if simulation is possible, there are umpteen worlds. Um, it's really likely that we're like, in the world that was simulated, not in the world that was real. Um, but there may come along someday some other concept, which is another way in which worlds could be created, which may be easy and even mm -hmm. computational, uh, which vastly uh, you know, produces a say, set of worlds that we would have expected under a simulation. Mm -hmm. And so um, I would say that almost all of my weight lies in this sort of space of unknown concepts, which um, you know, this sort of epistemological path we've been on, the scientific method, hopes to eventually sort of find foundation for or discover. Like, you know, the dream certainly of physics is understanding what happened before the Big Bang, that sort of thing. Um, I think of that in the face of future knowledge, it's um, like easy for me to put weight on that which we do not know exists. Mm -hmm. Unknown unknowns. Yes. Very excited to be able to discover those as we keep pushing. Last question. Yeah. What is the most beautiful thing in the world? Oh, yeah. Climbing the heights of abstraction. Mm. That's real. That's real. It's um, basically transcendent. And uh, the highest levels conceivable, I think, is cre capable of generating all of reality in a moment. Mm. So. <laughs> huh. uh, that, was a, that was a good one. Climbing yeah. the heights of abstraction.
That's such a good one. And it is transcendent. It's extremely transcendent. If you can synthesize all that is into some beautiful abstraction, a film, uh, yeah. a short video, a meme, a book. A function that generates reality. So what simulation yeah, yeah. is, is saying that, well, you can ask which one's more real, but there's this abstract function that's being used to create our reality, which is a data generating function. So it's a function where, you know, uh, it will create the data points in light of some transition function. And if you look at that function, you say, well, is our reality the data that's being generated, or is it more real to reference the generator itself, mm -hmm. right? As opposed to the output that it happens to be spitting out, right? Yeah. And there are umpteen ways in which the abstract reality is more real than the quote-unquote real reality. And it's certainly more general and more beautiful than, than the, the data that happens to exist. So referencing the generator. That's right. Versus what is being generated. That's right. Yeah, that's so cool. All right. This has been ridiculous, Jeremy. We have to have you back. Round two will have to happen sometime soon. This has been such a fascinating conversation, brother. Yeah, yeah. So, so grateful for you coming on the show. Yeah, yeah. Thank, you. thank you. Thank you. I'm glad you had a good time. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Huge thank you. Yeah. All right, and for all of those that tuned in, we greatly appreciate you. We'd love to hear your thoughts in the comments below on the episode. Check out the links also in the bio, the AI Google link, the Sys Creativity link, the Modeled Systems link. Check those out. Share them with your friends, the LinkedIn, Jeremy's LinkedIn profile. Get talking to more people, your friends, family, coworkers, people online on social media about abstraction and about creativity and about alignment. Get talking about these things more. Get sharing about them more. Huge shout out to Ron Vogus for producing and directing. Thank you very much, Ronnie. And Support the artists, the entrepreneurs, the organizations around the world that you believe in. Support simulation. Our links are below. Help us grow and prosper. And go and build the future, everyone. Manifest your dreams into the world. Thank you so much for tuning in, and we will see you soon. Peace.